Notations on x right here. So we saw that sine inverse x had a very small domain, and it was basically, I think, negative 1 to 1 was their domain. However, if you look at this form right here on the right side, what happens if x equals 1? I'm looking at this right here. What happens when x equals 1 here? You'll be divided by 0. And same thing if x is negative 1, you'll also be divided by 0. So that means somewhere around here, you need to also write way too big. Absolute value x less than 1. So not just less than or equal to 1, but less than 1. And when we move over to the uh, integral, same thing, except we use the letter u over here. So this is absolute value u has to also be less than 1. And somewhere else, cosine has the same problem, had the same domain. Cos inverse has the same domain, and we take derivative, you have the same issue. Absolute value x must be less than 1. So right now, you should be thinking, well, that's weird. A function has a larger derivative, a larger domain than its derivative. How in the world does that work? So let's look at the, I think we have a graph of sine inverse we can look at for a second. Somewhere, hopefully I graphed it. Did I graph it? Oh no. I thought we graphed one of these guys, I guess not. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, invert the blue graph right here. So this will be y equals, this is a cos function. So I'll be graphing the inverse cosine. So we're going to swap x and y. So this is going to look like this. So we'll go 0 to pi on the y-axis and so that'll be positive 1, negative 1, and we got 0, or pi over 2, 0 moves to 0 pi over 2. That's that point right there. And I probably should use blue over here. So we got that point. Uh, 0, 1, so this top blue point, 0, 1, becomes 1, 0. So we're going to go over 1, up 0, and the other point. Pi, negative 1, is reverse the order, negative 1 pi. So go left 1, up pi. Now we'll do our best to reflect this. So here's the y equals x line that we're going to reflect across. So when this reflects, what do we get? Our curve. will look like that right there when we reflect it. So there's the cosine inverse function graph. Why might we have a problem with the derivative at x equals 1? Let's try to draw a tangent line at x equals 1. What will the tangent line look like? A vertical line. It'll look like a vertical line. Before we hit 1, however, our slope will be some negative value. But when we actually hit 1, it will be negative infinity. So if we try to draw a uh, tangent line, it would look like that, a vertical line there. And there would be another vertical tangent on the other end. So the function's defined. The problem is the slope is infinitely steep at those two endpoints. So that's how our derivative is defined on everything that's not the endpoints. So it's a slightly weird phenomena that happens there. It also happens, uh-oh, that's encouraging. It also happens when uh, you have a square root function, for example. Your square root function looks like this, and it gets infinitely steep if you approach 1. So you would have a vertical tangent if you actually plugged in 0. So you'd have an undefined slope is the problem. There's plenty of other functions that something similar, very similar happens to. OK.
And if I inverted sine, something similar would happen. You see the, if I drew tangents on the regular sine at the ends, I would have horizontal tangents. So when I took the inverse of this, those horizontal tangents would become vertical tangents. So that happens the same thing on sine inverse. So if I invert this, those horizontal tangents flip to be vertical tangents. Or I should say they reflect to be vertical tangents. So they would have an undefined slope. You don't have the same problem with tangent inverse, because if we look at the tangent inverse graph, you never have vertical tangent here. So no point has a vertical tangent. So every tangent here has a defined slope. And I also told you don't bother circling the cos inverse antiderivative. It gives you no additional information. It'll just clutter up your uh, cheat sheet. So we get cos inverse. And next we'll do tan inverse. So the same thing we did for sine inverse, we'll do for tangent inverse. So I'll let f equal tan x, f prime derivative of tangent, secant squared x, which you could write as sec x squared. So I like to use the notation where the power is. Uh, in a place that makes more sense visually. And of course, f inverse x is tan inverse x. All right, derivative tangent inverse. It's the derivative of f inverse, which is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. All right, into f prime. I'm going to do something a little strange that we do whenever we're going to compose functions, and I don't want to mess up the way I write. So this is just to keep the notation a little bit nicer. This is secant. I'm just replacing x by a box. So it seems a little silly. f prime of a box is secant of the box and square that whole thing. The reason I'm doing this because I'm about to plug in f inverse of x. And if we plug in the inside part first, f inverse of x is tan inverse. So all I'm going to do is take tangent inverse of x and drop it inside that box inside. So this is secant of tan inverse of x whole thing squared. You can, of course, write it like this. However, I think that looks a little bit confusing because you're going to take the secant of tangent inverse first and then square that result. So if you write the square power in the middle, it looks like something a little different. So this is tricky, tricky notation. All right, seek tan inverse x. Oh, that looks like something we simplified back in pre-calculus class. So let's go ahead and simplify that right now. So we let the inside part equal theta. So let theta equal tan inverse x. That means tangent theta equals x. And I'm going to write it as x over 1, so I can build a triangle with Sokotoa. Ooh. Let's try this fancy. All right. Neat. So tangent, we got theta here. 
x opposite adjacent 1, and the other one is square root 1 plus x squared. So we just build our triangle up, and tan inverse x is theta. So this is just secant theta. So I just replaced tan inverse x by theta. And secant theta is 1 over cos theta, which is hypotenuse over adjacent. And that's square root 1 plus x squared over 1. All right, so that is secant of tangent inverse of x. So we just simplified that. That's a little review of pre-calculus 2 class, trigonometry. I'm going to erase the tricky notation. I don't really like it. I don't want it to trick us. So we'll just write this. We just reduce secant of tangent inverse x to square root 1 plus x squared. So it's going to be a square root of 1 plus x squared squared, and that cancels out to 1 plus x squared. Technically, it's absolute value 1 plus x squared. Why, in this case, do I not need absolute value? So as long as x is a real number, when you square it, you get a 0 or more. Unless you're using complex numbers, you don't have to worry about squaring something and it being negative. All right, so we pretty much did all the work we need to do. I already figured out f prime of f inverse of x, so I'm just going to drop in 1 plus x squared up where I see it. So there's our tangent inverse derivative right there. So we'll write that down and put it in a box. All that work we did below. Just let us write it down almost immediately. So there's the derivative of tangent inverse. Now, tangent inverse, was there any restrictions on the domain? No. No restrictions somewhere. We just saw the graph right there. Tangent inverse graph, all x's work. So I got no restriction on x's. So I don't need to put any conditions on x. This works for all x. So you don't really need to write all x and r, but I'll just write it so it matches. We get a free antiderivative. So I move the derivative to the other side as an antiderivative. So we're going to get the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus u squared. du equals the right side, tangent inverse u, plus constant. And this form is distinct from the last form. It's got no square root in it. So it looks very different than the other form that we saw. So I made you do all this if you followed along at the beginning of the quarter. This is one of the uh, things I told you to do for uh, practice at home. And then I gave you a cosecant, which we'll do that in a minute. Why, did the, um, why was the adjacent side set equal to 1? So we just got, originally we just had tan theta equals x. And I needed to have a I need tangent is opposite over adjacent, so I need an adjacent side. Okay. So I just took x and divided by 1, so I get an adjacent side, oh. which doesn't, it doesn't change x at all. And we'll do, that was tangent, we'll do cotangent next. Or I should say cotangent inverse is what we're going to do next. So somewhere we have a cotangent inverse identity. 
let's see. It was probably before we started doing calculus. Uh-oh. We really don't have one. Looks like my notes don't have that. So we'll write it down, then prove it, then use it. Go that order. Other identity we had with the pi over 2, the one that we did show had sine and cosine. So let's see if we can rebuild a triangle that has, that will show us this identity. So I'm gonna call one angle theta and I will call the other angle phi. So using tangent or cotangent, so how can I use a tangent function to relate x1 and theta? All right, who can relate x1 and theta with a tangent equation? Uh, tangent theta equals x over 1. There we go, tangent theta equals x over 1. If I want cotangent, cotangent would be 1 over x. The reason I'm not going to go with cotangent is because I want I don't want x over 1, I just want x. So I can just rewrite this tan theta equals x, no problem. And how do I solve for theta? So I go inverse tangent or r tan. So theta equals r tan or tan inverse x. All right, let's look at phi now. Oops. Well, we'll do tangent phi first and see why that's bad. What does tangent of phi look like? So we've got phi is in the upper right corner. That'll be 1 over x, opposite over, you have to change your perspective, the opposite side is 1, the adjacent is x now, because we're in the upper right corner. Now, I don't want 1 over x, I want regular x, so that's the cotangents, the reciprocal of that. So cotangents just x over 1, or just x, and phi equals cotangent inverse x. So this third angle is a right angle in our triangle, which we could call pi over 2 right there. 
what do I get if I add up all three angles in my triangle? Phi plus theta plus pi over 2 equals what? Equals pi, or angle sum is 180 degrees in Euclidean geometry, of course. All right, so subtract pi over 2 and change color to green. Phi plus theta equals pi minus pi over 2 is just pi over 2, and I'm going to replace phi by cos cotangent inverse and theta by tangent inverse. And what we get, phi cot inverse plus tan inverse equals pi over 2. So there's our identity. Add up those two, you get pi over 2. Now this works is not specific to this triangle. You might think, well, not every triangle has a base of 1. That's definitely true. Whatever the base of your triangle is, just scale it down to 1. And then whatever your original side was, if your side was 100, then I'll just make your triangle 100 times smaller. But the idea is your angles stay the same. So whatever your, if you're, if you had 100 down here, no problem. I'll just make a triangle 100 times smaller. And then whatever your original vertical side was will be 100 times smaller than that number. So I didn't choose 1 for any other reason other than it disappears when you divide by 1. So we just did, we just proved our identity, so it'll make our finding derivative way faster, basically. I was just missing a portion of the, the, the pi over 2. Okay. So we have this identity. Now I'm going to use it. Oh, the identity you just subtract tangent and inverse the other side, obviously. But that's probably not worth writing down. So now we showed our identity is true. Derivative cotangent inverse. I'm going to swap out cotangent inverse 4 pi over 2 minus tan inverse x. And now we're going to apply our derivative. So it's going to be 0 minus the derivative of tangent inverse, which is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So there is our derivative that we just got. Derivative of cotangent inverse is negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. And from this, we'll get our free antiderivative. So we're going to move the derivative to the other side as antiderivative and switch into u's. So we got antiderivative negative 1 over 1 plus x oh, u squared du equals Coat inverse u plus c. And let's get that negative sign out of there. So I'm going to multiply everything by negative 1. So integral 1 over 1 plus u squared du equals negative cotangent inverse u plus c. I don't really care if my c is plus c or minus c, because that's just a number anyways. So that'll just be a different number. I'm not going to put a box around this, because you already know how to integrate 1 over 1 plus u squared. You do it somewhere. Right up here. Just use tangent inverse. You have the option to write negative cotangent inverse if you want to, but just stick with this. Your cheat sheet will be smaller, more space for other stuff. So I'm not going to uh, put a box around the antiderivative we just found. So these are redundant. So just use the uh, tan inverse antiderivative, and you'll be OK here. All right, so that's cotangent inverse. And next, we'll do secant. I don't think we did secant and cosecant yet.
So I could find the derivative of secant inverse in a really similar way compared to the way we found the uh, tangent inverse derivative and whatever the first one, sine or cosine inverse, whichever we, we did first. There's also another way to do secant inverse. So let's switch it up instead of doing this all the same way. So let y equal secant inverse x. So flip the secant function to the other side as, or flip the secant inverse function to the other side as secant, which means secant y equals x. And now we're going to take a derivative of this. What is the x derivative of secant y? It's going to be a dy dx. Uh, we will have a dy dx from the chain rule, definitely. But what's the first part? What's the derivative of secant? Secant tangent. So derivative of secant is secant sec y tan y times we took an x derivative of a y function. So we get the extra y prime or the dy dx that comes out. What is the x derivative of the right side? X derivative of x? One. One. All right. So that side's nice. And I'm going to solve for dy dx dy dx equals 1 over sec y tan y. What is dy dx? We could write that as d dx of y equals 1 over sec y tan y. Now y is something I just made up. So let's take out y and drop in what y stood for, which is secant inverse x. So there's three places I see y, and I'm going to swap all three out with secant inverse x. What is secant of secant inverse of x, the first part right here? X. That's just x, as long as x is in certain uh, certain interval. And we'll look at that in a minute, but we'll just write x down for now. Did we do tangent of secant inverse? I think we did secant of tangent inverse, but not tangent of secant inverse. So we need to go and re, um, redo that simplification at the other order. So simplify All right, test your tr trig skills and simplify tangent of secant inverse. And I'll give you 2 minutes to simplify that out. And if you forgot how to do this, maybe one of your neighbors knows or you could flip back a page or two in your notes. We just did this.
So I want the algebra route instead of the triangle route. You can go either way. So any questions on squared x squared minus 1? If you went Sokotoa, hopefully you got the same thing. Tangent can't be positive or negative, however. So now all we did was figured out tangent of secant inverse. So I'm going to replace that by the square root x squared minus 1. You don't want to write plus minus like, like this. What does it look like if I put my plus minus? Looks like, Looks like I'm adding, subtracting, not multiplying the positive or negative version. So we're going to write our, oops, we'll write our plus minus out front. Make the whole thing positive or negative like that. So things get a little tricky with the plus and the minus. So the best thing to do is look at a graph and figure out is the slope positive or negative. So we'll do that. So I don't want to spend the full time graphing secant, chopping it up, chopping the domain down, and then inverting the graph. Because uh, to graph secant, you got to graph cosine, and then the reciprocal graph. So it takes quite a few steps. So I'm just going to draw the graph of secant inverse. And then we'll look at the slope. Now, really briefly, the original graph of secant looks something like this. Obviously not one to one, so we're going to slice it up. Another thing to notice, here's the x-axis. Your y has to be um, one or more, or negative one or less, which turns out to mean your x has to be more one or more, or less than one, less than negative one. So the graph's going to look a little bit strange. There is a, your vertical asymptote turns to a horizontal asymptote. And, oop, not there. So here's what your graph looks like. Don't draw what I'm going to draw in blue. Here we go, I'll do it in a highlighter. That'll work. Normally this graph has all these more, all these U-shaped pieces like this, but obviously that makes it fail to be a function. So that's why we cut off and just use um, as much as we can while still being a function. So we don't use any of these other parts. Okay. So the reason I did this, what can you say about the slope? Is there any general comments you can say about the slope? no matter what x value you're using in the domain. Well, it looks like we may have problems at negative 1 and 1. It looks like we'll have vertical slope there. So that's one thing to notice. This slope is vertical, which means undefined. So we'll get a divide by 0 if we actually try to plug in negative 1 or 1. All right, so that means right away, uh, absolute value of x, one way to write it, has to be greater than 1. So it's got to be bigger than positive 1 or less than negative 1. Is the slope always positive? Anytime the slope is negative, that you can tell from this graph. Slope's always positive. Go to the right, you're always going up. I mean, unless you're in the undefined area. So, slope's always positive. So how in the world do we reflect that here? X can be positive or negative. So we can throw an absolute value around. So the way we're going to deal with this, this is 1 over. Now the square root, can that square root ever give you a negative value? No. No. Uh, there are x values that could give you a complex value. However, all those x values are small. They're 1 and less, well, really less than 1. The good news is we already cut all those out. So all the small x values are gone. So we don't have to worry about the square root 
being uh, zero or negative because we've already thrown out all those x values right there. You can see them. So here is our derivative. We fixed the plus minus issue. So sometimes you're going to go with regular x, and if x is negative, you would have gone with negative x. But we can fix that by this right here. So there's our inverse derivative, or our secant inverse derivative. And we said absolute value of x had to be greater than 1 for this to work. Otherwise, you're going to get undefined or com complex value. This looks different than our, anti than our other derivatives do. It's a little similar to the 1 over square root, but there's an extra x in front. So that extra x makes a very different form. If you are a step function person, I'll write that version down. So written as a step function, it's either itself or negative itself. So when would I be using piece one, the top piece here? So yeah, I want to be a little, per, little more precise than just greater than 0, because we can't be 1 half, for example. Greater than 1. So x is positive and greater than 1. Then you don't need your absolute value anymore. So this one is x is greater than 1. And remember, if x equals 1, you're going to have a vertical slope. And you can see that happen. If x equals 1, you get 1 minus 1, which will be 0. What about the, what's the condition on x for the second version? Yep, x is less than uh, negative 1. So if you want to write out as a step function, you can use this right here. So absolute value always turns into a step function. It's either regular x or negative x. And it's negative x if it would have been negative anyways. So you can use either of these two. I don't care which one you use. Whatever one works better for your home. You may want to put both on and then erase one at some point later on, whichever one you find more useful. So only put one of those two on your cheat sheet. So top one involves less writing but maybe more confusing. So whatever works better for you. OK, antiderivative. For the antiderivative, we'll run with the We'll go with a modified version of the first one. So move the derivative to the other side in the first one. So we have 1 over u square root u squared minus 1 du antiderivative. And we did have the absolute value on the left side, but we're going to move the absolute value to the right side. And secant inverse is 1 over cosine. Inver well, no, it's not 1 over cosine inverse. Oh, that's very not true. Don't assume that. Secant inverse. Yeah, we don't have necessarily a nice way to relate secant inverse to cosine inverse. So that was our derivative of secant inverse and associated antiderivative. And we'll go cosecant 
inverse next. And we'll use the identity that we just derived. Did we have a secant? The only one that I see, or at least the only one I see after looking for a couple seconds. I see this one. This one is written down in my notes, but I don't think we've proved it. Um, we did just show one, but I think we had tangents and cotan. Yeah, we did one with tangents and cotangents. We didn't do a secant, cosecant yet. All right, let's try the same trick we did before. Good enough. So secant and cosecant use the hypotenuse. So I'm going to say the hypotenuse is 1, and it probably doesn't matter which side I call x. So I'll just go that one, call that one x. So we're going to have a theta. I'll use the same names, theta and phi, right here. So what does theta equal? Use, not theta, we'll go with, what does cosecant theta equal? Or is that a, the bad function? That's one over sine. Ah, oh, why is that one bad? It would use the side I didn't put any label on right there. So let's not do cosecant, and let's do Regular secant. So 1 over cosine, that is hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse is 1, adjacent is x. Right, so secant theta, 1 over x. Now I want secant theta to equal x. So what I'm going to do is change my labels. Oops, that didn't change anything. We'll go with x on the hypotenuse and 1 right there. So now hypotenuse is x adjacent 1, so secant theta is just x in this new triangle. So hopefully this makes cosecant work out nicely. Cosecant of phi is 1 over sine phi, which is hypotenuse over opposite. Hypotenuse is still x, opposite of phi is 1. So cosecant of phi is x. All right, flip these around. Theta equals seek inverse x. Flip the second one around. Phi equals cosecant inverse x. And now, let's just shortcut straight to the sum of these two angles is pi over 2, because I know the other one's already pi over 2. So they all add up to pi. So these two angles will be pi over 2 plus the other pi over 2. Get that pi over 2. So that gives us our secant 
we're running out in Greek letters secant plus or er, phi plus theta equals pi over two, and then running it was cosecant inverse x plus sec inverse x equals pi over two, and then subtract secant inverse, and you get our identity that we wrote down. All right, using this identity, what's that? That identity, And now making that substitution, we can take our derivative is zero minus one over absolute value x square root x squared minus one. X squared minus one, yes. And we have a really similar problem with uh, the domain. If x is small, we're going to have the same uh, problem before. So this works when absolute value of x is not only uh, 1 or negative, or you can't be 1 or negative 1. That will give you infinity, but also past 1 or negative 1. And we'll write the step function version. It'll look really similar to the other one, except that it'll be There'll be a, the negative sign will be in the other spot, basically.